Hey guys, welcome back to the Outcheaping YouTube channel. My name's Austin, and in today's video, we're going to be getting back to finishing up this lift kit on this 1978 Jeep J10 truck. As you guys saw previously in part one, we knocked out the majority of the front suspension. We still got a few little components to finish up on the front, then we're going to tackle the rear and get this thing all complete. So, let's get started. Alright, so finishing up for the front suspension, we finally got our front shock towers and these are made by 999 Off-Road and at first glance I can tell they're definitely a lot more beefier than the stock ones. Nice eighth inch construction and one thing I like is that it's nice and capped off here because as you guys recall, a bunch of dirt and gravel likes to get caught in there and then it just rots them out. It also did come with some new hardware, so we got some new nuts and washers where our upper shock end is going to attach to and then we got some new 3 8 bolts that are going to bolt it to the frame. Now comparing these to the factory ones, I'm definitely glad I bought these ones because even if you did sandblast it, um, the other one didn't have holes, but if I were to clean that one up, it still would have been a pretty uh, thin metal compared to this thick eighth inch that's nice and brand new. One thing I'll mention is that these are pretty much stock height replacements. They also offer ones that are for extended shocks, so they're a little bit taller, but I opted to go with the factory replacement. Now these did come nice and painted, so I'm going to go bolt them onto the frame and then just give them a quick coat of that semi-gloss to match it in with the rest of the frame. All right, so just starting over here on the driver's side wheel well, we got our shock tower, and you want to make sure you have the right side one that the uh, stud is actually facing the rear of the vehicle. And so this is going to bolt three bolts to the frame. We got one that's actually threaded right here, and then two of them, they're going to go all the way through, and then we'll have to put some nuts on them. I'm going to put some anti-seize on the bolts because I don't want these to lock up over time. All right, so actually I had to take a 3 8 drill bit and wall out one of these holes because it was just a little bit mislined, but got all the bolts in. Now I'm going to go and tighten everything down. All right, that shock tower is all ready to go. I'm going to go and uh, clean this up a little bit, match with the paint, do the other side, and we'll be back to install the shocks. All right, so getting the shocks prepped to be installed onto the Jeep, uh, we have to do a couple things first, and one of those is to install our metal bushings. And for this Jeep, we only have to do it on the bottom over here. So with these Rough Country shocks, they actually did come with a bushing set. As you can see, this is what comes in each pack. It's actually four separate sizes, and I uh, checked it out for the width and the uh, bolt diameter. So the second to largest one right here is gonna work perfect for us. So I'm gonna install this on the bottom here, and I also went ahead and bought some new half inch bolts that are gonna bolt for the bottom of the shock that's bolted to the axle. Then we got some hardware right here that came with our new shock towers up front. And one thing I did off camera is I clear coated these shocks just because the paint is a little bit thin on them, and if any salt or anything gets on them, they like to start rusting. So just a little bit more protection, I did that. So I'm gonna install these bushings onto the lower shocks over here. Don't have to worry about the top end. That's gonna be the perfect diameter for fitting over on our shock towers. And then we can go and install these on the vehicle. So I'm just going to use a little bit of grease and lube up any mating surfaces on this so that way everything goes in nice and smoothly. And just to make things go a little bit faster and smoother, I'm just going to take a C-clamp and we'll press in this sleeve. All right, so got those bushings in, now we'll go install them. I'm gonna start over here on the axle side and bolting it down here first. And first thing I'm gonna do is just lube up the bolt with some anti-seize, so that way this doesn't uh, freeze up in the future. Now the factory bolts on this uh, did come out nicely, um, but I decided to get some new hardware. They actually had some uh, half inch fine thread, but I just went with some coarse thread since they're cheaper. There's no real uh, big difference in that. And I got a lock washer and nut for the other side. Now for up on the shock tower, I'm actually just going to use a little bit of grease where the bushing is going to go on so that way it doesn't squeak or have any premature wear on that rubber bushing. And then I'm going to take some anti-seize and put it on the threaded portion. 
Now I'll cut our cable and then we'll quickly uh, slide this into place. Now it's a little bit difficult on this upper bushing right here since it is slightly on an angle. So I'm gonna help it the rest of the way. So I'm gonna get a nut on here. Now we got our washer and our nut. And we can just tighten this down. Now I can snug up over here in the bottom. These are all gonna be a three quarter. All right, so that shock is all tightened down. It's looking good in there. We're gonna go do the other side off camera. And then next we'll take care of the sway bar. All right, so now taking care of the front sway bar, the uh, bushings finally came in for that. I actually had to order it three times total to get the correct ones. First one I ordered, I uh, miscalculated the diameter on the sway bar. I believe that one was like a 13 16 and this sway bar is a 7 8 And uh, I did order 7 8 ones right here, which were out of stock for a while. Ordered them, and they're, they're actually the incorrect size. They're still 13 16 I think it was packaged wrong by the manufacturer, but tried to uh, contact customer service on where I ordered from and didn't hear really anything back from them. So I went with a different brand, a little bit more expensive. Comes with these brackets right here. And these are the correct 7 8 ones and these are uh, poly bushings instead of rubber right here. So these ones are from Energy Suspension. They come with some washers, the brackets, the bushings, and then they have a little bit of uh, grease right here that's gonna be perfect for using on these polyurethane bushings. I also went ahead and got some new sway bar end link bolts. These guys are tapered right here, so they're gonna go through one end of the link. I got some new castle nuts right here that when we tighten up, we can put a cotter pin through there so we don't have to worry about them backing out. I'm also gonna reuse the original hardware, bolting this up to the frame. I got everything all here sandblasted and repainted, new bushings in these uh, factory sway bar links right here. Um, we might need to extend these in the future, but we're gonna install this setup for now and see how it is. So to get started, it's pretty straightforward. I'm gonna start off with putting these bushings on before I get it on the vehicle and uh, make sure I put some lube on there. And then we're gonna bolt it to the frame first and then we're gonna start adding in the links. And I'll actually add grease to the uh, bar once I know the final location as far as the uh, width where the frame rails are going to line up for this. So I'm just going to slide these on for now and then I can add some grease and then slide them back to where they're going to go. So I'm going to line this up on where it should go, line up the bushings and then we'll get them greased up. So it's looking like they're pretty much going to go all the way out right before the turn. So I'll take this out, put a little grease in there, and then we should be good. All right, so next thing I'm gonna do is actually just put half the bracket in, just a couple threads, and swing them out of the way. And then I should have enough uh, playroom right here, so that way I can push the sway bar up and uh, twist this bracket over, and it'll hold in place since I don't have another person holding the other bar. It might be a little bit difficult. But before I put the bolts in, I'm gonna use a little bit of anti-seize on these uh, threads right here, so that way they don't snap off in the future. Have it right there and then I'll do the other side and if you are reusing these factory bolts they're going to be a 5 8 bolt head on them all right so I got all bolts started and I haven't tightened it down yet um, I'm going to start off with the position of actually sliding the sway bar towards the front of the Jeep as far as I can go as you can see you can slide back and forth on these brackets so I'm going to start off uh, all the way forward and the sway bar is pretty much centered underneath the Jeep because it can't really go out any further on the sway bar with these bushings and uh, it'll kind of auto adjust too since there is supposed to be a little bit of uh, movement in here since it's all greased up. All right, so now moving on to the sway bar link and that's going to connect from our sway bar down to our axle, um, which is basically coming off of the bracket for the leaf spring right here. So it's gonna pop into down there. And I didn't get any new hardware for here, but I got them sandblasted and painted. So I cleaned up the threads around here. I'm gonna put a little bit of uh, silicone-based grease on here for these polyurethane bushings. A little bit of anti-seize for the threads. And then we can tighten this guy up just a little bit um, until we get the top end in. Then we can torque everything down.
So I've got some new washers to hold this in. And then the socket size in this is going to be 11 sixteenths. I'm going to leave it a little bit loose for now, and then we'll get the top done. And then we're going to use our new sway bar length hardware for this upper end right here. It does have a slight taper, so it's going to lock into the sway bar, so that way when we tighten up this nut, it doesn't spin on us. But same thing before, I'm going to lube this up the same way. So then I got a washer, and then our castle nut. So unfortunately for this, it looks like the castle nuts I got are a little bit too wide in width. And once it's tightened down, that hole for the cotter pin is not exposed. So later on, I'm just gonna have to swap these out. Um, but for now, these should be fine. Just wanna make sure they're nice and snug. Now I'll go do the other link and then we'll be back to torque down the upper bolts going to the frame. All right, so our angle is a little bit low on the sway bar once we got both the links installed and the Jeep is sitting at ride height on its own weight. Um, so I probably will order those in the future, but for now, we're just gonna continue putting this back together. Um, I got those pretty much snugged up on the sway bar link. There's not really any torque spec I could find on that. Um, just wanna make sure it uh, compresses the uh, bushing a little bit, and that way it's not gonna walk off and not too tight where it's going to have any premature wear on that bushing. Um, so I'm just going to torque down these guys up here on the frame. Once again, not really any torque specs I could find, so I'm just going to go with 40 foot-pounds of torque. Alright, so as far as torquing down our leaf spring bolts and shackle bolts, um, since the front of the Jeep is on jack stands from the front axle, the full weight of the Jeep is on the suspension, so it's all right to torque them down right now. And these 916 bolts, I'm going to torque them down to 130 foot pounds. All right, so taking a look at the components that we're going to be installing on the rear suspension of this J10. We got some Rough Country Leaf Springs right here. These guys are pretty beefy, about 75 pounds each. So these are going to be going on the rear. We also got some U-bolts to correspond with that. And then we also got some shocks that Rough Country sent out with some uh, bushings in case we need to swap them out uh, for our application. But as you guys know, with these old rusty vehicles, a lot of other things break. So we're going to have to be replacing other things as well. So same thing we did with the front. We got some rear bump stops. These are going to be the same exact part number for the fronts. So we're going to swap those in as well. I went and got some new leaf spring bolts off of McMaster car. These are 5 8 bolts, as you guys saw from the front. They're going to be the same exact size. I got some lock nuts and washers to go with that as well. Now, I have seen from other Jeeps that the rear leaf spring hangers, they like to rot out. And it's the same story on this Jeep right here. And now, unfortunately, they don't make any replacement ones directly for the Jeep J10. But what a lot of people do is actually take Ford Ranger rear leaf spring hangers. They're actually fairly inexpensive, about 15, 20 bucks a piece. And they can measure these out, bolt them to the frame, and then should be able to bolt on your new leaf spring. So we'll have to cut out the old brackets, measure and make sure we place these correctly, drill some holes, and then bolt them on. Now I got these from ATS. I contacted their customer support there, um, tell them what my needs were, and they said uh, a lot of people use this, so I went with them. So I ordered their shackle and leaf spring hanger kit. One thing I did notice is that their shackles are a little bit longer since they are for a Ford Ranger, but a 90s Ford Ranger. I'll post a link in the description below for all these parts, by the way. Um, but they are a little bit longer than the factory one, and since this is a leaf under in the rear, um, if you have a longer shackle, it's actually going to lower the suspension even more. So I'm probably not going to use this. Instead, I'm going to do the same thing as the front. Um, take them out, pound out the old bushings, get them sandblasted and painted. Then I got some new bushings right here that should pop in. The rear shackles are also going to be the same exact shackles as they were for the front for the J10. I know they're a little bit different on the J20. That's pretty much it on uh, components. I do notice that the front leaf spring hangers um, on the driver's side, I believe that one's all right. Passenger side, it looks like part of it's a little bit rusted, so I might have to repair that and weld in some new eighth inch plate there. Uh, but for the most part, they're a lot more intact than the rear ones. So I'm going to get started, get this rear end jacked up. We're going to start taking off components. We're probably going to have to cut the U-bolts again and get some of that bracketry all uh, sandblasted and painted up nicely, kind of how I did on the front, so that way the rear looks just as good. And then the main thing is going to be tackling the brackets and getting them located where we want them.
right, so I got the rear end all jacked up and the rear part of the frame on some heavy duty jack stands, which is holding most of the weight. And I got the axle drooped down as far as it can go um, with the jack underneath it for now. But I think we're limited onto the shocks. Um, I think the suspension could drop a little bit more. And then we can get these leaf springs out of compression and drop it down lower onto some other jack stands. So the next thing I'm gonna do is unbolt the shocks. All right, so for tackling these rear shocks over here on the frame side, we got a stub coming out from the frame and there's gonna be a nut that we're gonna take off. That's gonna be a three quarter nut. Then over here on the bottom where it connects to the axle, we just have a standard uh, half inch bolt that's gonna be three quarter on each side. So should be pretty straightforward on that. Now I did spray these bolts a couple days in advance and make sure they're nice and soaked, uh, but I'm still gonna use some heat because I don't wanna snap the stud going into the frame because um, that's gonna be a pain in the butt if I have to fix that. And then over here, we can uh, quickly zip off this bottom one. If it breaks, that's fine. We're gonna replace that bolt anyway. shock is out I'm gonna go and do the same thing on the other side all right so let's take a look and see if it drops down even lower all right so not a whole lot lower um, that's probably just maxed out on the spring we're gonna put another set of jack stands underneath the axle because now we're going to disconnect the axle from the leaf springs and these are looking pretty cruddy so I'm just gonna end up cutting these u-bolts and then this axle is pretty much gonna drop down from the Jeeps so we want to make sure it's not going to fall to the floor or on top of something, so we have these jack stands here. All right, so taking a closer look at this rear suspension, we actually have a spring over the axle compared to spring under the axle like the front suspension. And then instead of uh, shackle over, we got shackle under, um, which we'll see a little bit later coming to the rear. So next thing I'm gonna do is disconnect the axle from the suspension. So these are looking pretty crusty. I wasn't able to knock them free with my big impact on the front side, so I'm gonna cut these off. Um, you wanna make sure you're wearing some PPE in case uh, stuff goes flying, because these are under tension. So I'm gonna take an angle grinder, cut these out, and then they should be able to drop from the bottom as well as pop out from the top and take off this bracket. <laughs> So looking in the driver's wheel well towards the rear and taking a look at these bolts and they're not going to be fun taking these out. Um, I already tried uh, breaking them free. The top one spins um, and I can hold a wrench so I can get that one out um, which it goes to the shackle but unfortunately I can't uh, take it out all the way because the bolt is in the opposite direction and it needs to clear the frame so which means we have to take out the other bolt first and looking on the other end where the nut is um, exposed underneath it is so corroded that it doesn't even look like a nut anymore so I can't get anything on that um, I was able to move it though uh, within the leaf spring but it just spins the other side so it looks like we're gonna have to cut out most of this and it's okay if we cut the bracket on the rear since we're gonna be replacing that but we're gonna have to be a little bit more delicate up front 
And so looking up front on the driver's side, um, actually this is the bad bracket that I was talking about that we still need to save. It's rotted out down here, but it's still fairly solid up here. So I'm just going to have to patch that with some eighth inch steel. On the passenger side, it actually looks a lot better um, and we won't have to do any patching on that. But same thing over here, there is a nut on the back side of the frame and it's actually in between the frame and the gas tank. So it's a little bit hard to get at. I can't get any impacts at this, unfortunately. So I'm gonna probably have to cut this one too and be cautious of that fuel tank right there. I might remove that as well. And I'm assuming the other side is gonna be just as difficult. So I'm gonna go and uh, get these cut out and I'll come back and show you guys uh, all the techniques I did because I'm sure these aren't gonna go smoothly. So I'll get these cut out. All right, so fast forward a bit. I got both the leaf springs out. I pretty much had to cut every single corner or pretty much all the bolts except for the ones going to the leaf springs to the shackle. Those actually came out pretty nicely. And look how clean they are from 40 plus years of rust on this Jeep. I was surprised they look so good the way they do. But everything else was pretty much rotted. I had to cut twice on every bolt to get them out and uh, some of the nuts I couldn't even get a wrench on to help kind of break it off because the nut was just so misshapen from rust like this one right here. As you can see, uh, some metal is remaining on these bolts right here. These bolts are still kind of seized inside that bushing right there, but this metal is from the rear brackets and I kind of assisted uh, cutting them out since we're gonna be replacing them anyway. And it was just a lot easier than trying to get in there um, with a cutoff wheel. Uh, if I had a Sawzall, it'd be a little bit easier um, to get at, but it would take a little bit more time. But overall, I'm gonna have these shackles and these leaf spring plates right here sandblasted, and then I'm gonna paint them and then we're gonna basically just reuse them um, because there's really nothing wrong with them. They're actually still in great shape. I got new bushings that are gonna go in here, and then I'm gonna have a friend uh, press out these bushings. But we can still continue on the Jeep because we still have to cut off the remaining rear leaf spring brackets and uh, get ready to uh, mount up the new ones on there. Then I'm gonna clean the frame a little bit where those are gonna be mounted and paint them up nicely. All right, so taking a closer look at the front leaf spring mount over here on the driver's side, it's pretty rotted out here on the bottom. Basically, it's because it's a boxed in design and all the uh, dirt and gravel that's getting flung up from the tires is just landing in here and all that holds moisture and it just rots out as you can see. The other side actually isn't too bad and we might not have to do anything to it, but as you can see, we're gonna have to cut out all this rusted metal and I'm gonna try and patch it in the best I can. Up here on the top, it's actually still really solid. So I'm just going to be putting in a new bottom plate part of this side and part of this back plate over here. So I'm gonna to get to cutting and just cut out basically anything that's rusted through or uh, looks pretty thin from the rust. And I think I'm gonna go as high as cutting out this hole right here, but we got this hole right here on the frame for reference um, for drilling the new hole in the plate over here, uh, which I'm probably just gonna take a bolt coming through the other side of the frame, uh, put an angle finder on it, make sure it's completely uh, square and straight, and then I can mark the hole on our new plate that we're gonna weld in and then I can drill it. So I'm gonna get started and start cutting out this old stuff. Just gotta keep in mind that there's a fuel tank right here, so I might put a little shield, so that way we don't have any fires. All right, so a little update. I got all the rust areas cut out where I want it to. I'm still gonna have to clean up and grind where it's still welded on the frame over here and clean up any areas where I'm gonna be welding to um, with the new sheet metal and probably get in here with any wire wheel. Um, so that way everything's nice and clean and I can get it um, all prepped for when I do repaint this. But as you can tell, it looks a lot different, um, easier to see. I actually removed the entire truck bed on this Jeep um, just because it's gonna be 10 times easier to be able to uh, Reweld this in here. I can get at any angle I want as well as doing the rear ones uh, with cutting out the old brackets and uh, bolting on the new ones. I just hard to get a drill in there, an angle grinder or a welder uh, when you're doing this. Also, while I have this off, I'm going to have the entire uh, frame all wire wheeled and uh, ground down to hopefully uh, bare metal and I'm going to repaint it so it's all going to look pretty much brand new. But it wasn't fun taking out the uh, truck bed, um, especially with only two people. The thing was pretty heavy. Um, and most of the bolts just ended up having to be cut off and even this one right here they just you couldn't get a socket on there because it's so rusted um, and this one actually just pulled through on the bedside also had to remove the fuel tank because that was held in onto the bed um, and i'm going to have to be replacing that as well because it's the original steel tank and you can get a plastic one for about a couple hundred bucks the metal one was all full of uh, rust flakes and stuff so it would have been good uh, going down the road but since my fuel gauge was broken, the uh, fuel sender was broken on 
inside the tank. I didn't know how much fuel was in there. It ended up being actually a full tank, so that wasn't fun as well. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to continue. I'm going to clean this up with a flap disc, um, get the wire wheel in here, and clean it all up to uh, nice clean metal. Then we're going to start patching this up into the original box shape it was with some new eighth inch steel. And I'm just going to be uh, doing a few different pieces and cutting them out with either cardboard or paper. Um, that way I can kind of trace it onto metal. That way I know it fits and then I can start tacking things together. All right, so I got this all cleaned up around here as much rust as I could with my angle grinder and wire wheel um, while I have all these uh, brackets not in place because it's going to be harder once we start patching it up. Um, so that's exactly what I already started doing. Basically, I'm starting off with this front plate right here, um, finishing up this box end that I cut out. Unfortunately, this line right here is kind of on an angle, but that's fine. Just a couple more measurements. Um, it was hard to get it straight with the bed on here earlier when I was cutting off this bracket. Um, but basically, I'm just taking a cardboard piece right here, taking a few measurements, so I got a slight angle going right here, and just placing the cardboard in place. Um, it is roughly around an eighth of an inch, and that's what we're going to be replacing this right here with. And that's the type of steel we're going to be using to uh, rebuild this bracket right here. So it's fairly close. So I got our measurement right here. I'm starting with this front plate and uh, roughly it's going to go down to here. Um, I took the final measurement coming down. I just took a vice grip and put a, a straight edge down here so I know how far I have to go down. Um, it's not too big of a deal if it's too long um, because we can always cut it once we weld in that bottom plate. Uh, but I already transferred this measurement over to a piece of eighth inch plate that I got. So this guy is going to fit in right here. Maybe a little bit of a gap right there, but that's fine. We can fill that in with weld. And uh, any other weird angles that are popping out, we can grind down to make this bracket look good. So I'm going to tack this into place right here, get this as uh, perfect as I can. And then I'm going to work on this uh, plate coming down over here. And then finally, I'm going to work on that bottom plate, just kind of referencing the other side. Since the other side's pretty much solid, it's fairly simple unboxing this all in, going flat to the frame and these sides coming down. The only thing we have to make sure is that the bottom plate actually comes in about an inch and a half compared to the top plate right here, so it's going to be a little bit shorter down there, so just referencing from the other side. So I'm going to get the welder all set up, I'm going to tack this into place, not fully weld it so we get all the sides in, and then we can fully burn it in. All right, so I got this piece tacked in just enough where it's solid on there, but I can still move it and tweak it if I want to. And off camera, I just tweaked this a little bit because I noticed this uh, existing bracket up here was actually kind of bent upwards because uh, a lot of the Jeep's weight was pushing up on it since the rest of the bracket was pushing out. So I took an angle finder, found a level place on the Jeep, compared it to the other side, which is about a half degree upward, and I matched it to the other side over here, which was around three or three and a half degrees um, upward so I had to pound it down a little bit with the hammer got it there and this side also wasn't quite square so I had to pound it this way to make a nice 90 degrees and then can take my square put it on here and there's a little bit of a divot right here just from hammering but overall this is nice and square nice and flush up to this bracket over here so this side is pretty much ready to go um, I'm not going to weld anymore until I get the other bracket in place because I don't want this to warp out of place so what I'm going to do is do the same thing, just kind of cut a piece for this back side right here, tack it into place to make sure everything is nice and straight and square, and then I'll finish off with this bottom plate, and then uh, trim up any sides if they're sticking out, and then fully weld this in solid. I might go ahead and do this top weld over here on this existing bracket, because if you guys know with these FSJ Jeeps, uh, they didn't really do any good welds from the factory, like it is pretty bad. Definitely when it passes a vehicle today, so I'm going to go and beef up these welds while I'm at it. All right, so I got my last piece tacked in down here. Now I'm going to go and fully burn this in and make sure not to focus on one spot, kind of jump around so that way no warping occurs. And then I'll come back, grind any welds I need to smooth and round off this corner and make it look uh, pretty much like the factory one as much as I can. So that way it looks nice and clean and it looks like the original bracket.
All right, so a little update on this bracket. I got everything welded in and ground down. It actually looks pretty much factory over here. You can't even really tell where the transition is. I also went and threw a 9 16 hole in here and lined it up with the back one on the frame sides. So this bracket is pretty much finished. I also uh, re-welded this on top of here where it's going to the frame because uh, the factory weld was looking a little bit sketchy. So I just threw another bead on there and burned that in nice and hot. So now moving on to the rear leaf spring mounts. As you can tell, these are pretty rotted as well. Ended up just having to cut out this area right here because the bolt was uh, rusted inside that leaf spring bushing. But as you can tell, it's fairly pitted and this end over here was pretty much rotted out, rotted out on the sides and under here, it's supposed to be connected down as well. So what we're gonna do for this is actually cut it clean off and to fix this, unfortunately, they don't make replacement brackets that you can weld on. But a lot of people do for these cheap J10 trucks is actually use a 90s Ford Ranger uh, rear leaf spring shackle mount that uh, bolts to the frame. It gets it fairly close. We might have to do a little bit of spacing um, left to right, such as uh, putting different washers in here. Um, so we're going to have to take a measurement from the frame to here, um, get everything squared away, um, and then also mark our center point for our bolts. Just kind of trace it on the frame. I actually already did that. I just took a 5 8 drill bit, got it as level and uh, centered as I could, and made a little mark on the frame so that way when I line up the new bracket, I should be able to uh, get it fairly close. Then we'll mark out the holes, drill them, and then that'll get bolted onto the frame after I go and wire wheel and paint the entire frame. I may still have to remove this uh, homemade bumper that's kind of bolted to the bottom of the frame because part of the uh, bracket here is kind of welded onto the bottom of the frame. It's kind of just pinched in between the uh, bumper here, but there's just three bolts um, from the inside of the C channel that I'll just have to get at. Um, hopefully they'll come off with the impact, otherwise I'll have to cut them out as well. So if you have some centering punches, you can easily fit that in the hole and it'll uh, line up the hole itself and then you can make them mark on the frame. I don't have any punches like those, um, so I just got a 5 8 drill bit. So I want to make sure it's pretty much level and it's going to be centered, not off to any weird angles. Um, that way I can just go like this. And uh, I already did it, but it made a mark if you look through the hole. So that way we can line up with our new bracket when we get this cut off. So now I'm going to go right ahead, get a cutoff wheel and start cutting off this bracket. There we go. As you can see right here, that's my little centering mark. So I don't want to uh, scrape that off. Just want to make sure I know where that is. Um, maybe I'll take some measurements and then I'll uh, clean up all this uh, old welded material. And then it looks like I'm just going to have to remove this bumper as well, but I won't bore you guys with that. All right, so got that old weld all ground down, and now what I'm gonna do is take our new Ford Ranger bracket right here and line it up with the hole in the bracket to the mark I made over here on the frame. Try and get that as centered as possible. So I'm gonna get that centered on there and then make sure that the bracket is also square so it's not going one way or the other. Then I'm gonna mark all four of the holes on the bracket and then we can start drilling them into the frame. And that way this thing can be nice and secure. So I'm going to take a couple C-clamps, clamp them right here, and hold it into place and make minor adjustments. All right, so I got the bracket where I want it. Looking through this hole right here, that uh, mark that I made is nice and centered, and I made sure that the distance between the top of the frame and the top of the bracket is the same on both of them, so it's level with the frame. Now I'm going to go around and mark the very centers of each of the four holes on this bracket. All right, with those marked out, I'm gonna start small with the pilot hole, start with an eighth inch, make sure I get it nice and centered on my marks. Since I don't have a punch on me to uh, indent in the metal, so that way the bit doesn't wander. That's the main thing, you don't want it to wander. Uh, we'll start big and then we'll work our way up. All right, so we got all four of our holes drilled to 7 16 
I actually didn't have a 716th drill bit, so I ended up using my reamer and just carefully uh, drilled them to size, made sure not to go too far. Um, but I uh, worked up from a uh, eighth inch to a quarter inch, a three eighths, and then I used that reamer. If I had a 716th, I just used that there. But now we got them all drilled. Now I'm going to test um, with our new bolts right here. Make sure they all go in. And there we go. That's going to look pretty nice when we get the new uh, suspension in there, as well as painting the frame. But this bracket's all pretty much ready to go. I'm going to go ahead and do the other side off camera, and then we'll be back to uh, prep this frame. You guys may be wondering why the frame looks a lot more rustier and why there's paper towel and stuff on here. So I'm going to explain a little bit what I'm doing to kind of get rid of uh, all the rust on the frame. I already went ahead off camera, just kind of ground down as much as I could on this rear frame, or with wire wheels, with some stripping discs. Um, and even grinding pads just trying to get this rust off because it's pretty thick back here and a lot of it's pitted and uh, even after doing all that there's still a lot of that deep pitted rust that you really can't get off so what I've actually done is try to acidically remove this with just using household vinegar um, I've seen this technique of actually just soaking a paper towel on it so that way the frame stays saturated with that vinegar to help kind of dissolve it and that way you're going to get the best results because otherwise if you just spray it on there it's actually going to do the opposite and actually uh, start corroding it a little bit more um, so i let this sit for about 24 hours completely soaked i reapplied it all during the day and then it dried out over the night so there is a little bit of surface rust under here but i'll show you the other side if you just take a quick wire wheel to it it cleans up pretty nice and that's what we got going on back here. As you can tell, this is where I just peeled off that paper towel. I did change out the paper towel because it did get pretty rusty um, during the day yesterday. And then I just take vinegar and a scotch bright, and it helps kind of loosen up all this uh, thick rust in here. And then this morning when it was all dry, I took it off and took a wire wheel to it and just kind of cleaned it up. And this is pretty good, pretty much prepped as much as I can get on this frame. Just a little tiny uh, rust that's in there that's pretty deep in there. but. The next thing I'm going to do um, once I get it to this stage is actually use the product called Rust Cutter, uh, which is basically phosphoric acid, and that's going to chemically convert any residual uh, rust that's in the metal um, and make it into a nice uh, paintable surface. And then you guys know we're going to hit it with a few coats of PUR15, and then I'm going to do self-etching primer, and I like to use semi-gloss engine paint to uh, paint the frame right here. I like to use the Duplicolor brand because it dries a lot faster than Rust-Oleum, so I'm not using Rust-Oleum anymore, I've just had bad luck with their things not being able to dry and it, and it's still pretty soft paint after a week. This stuff dries to the touch pretty fast and, and cures fully only in a day or two, so that's what we're going to be doing for the final coat. So off camera I'm just going to get this all ground down to uh, this condition on the whole rear frame. I'll show you uh, putting on the uh, rust cutter, basically it's just in a spray bottle, but I'm going to brush it on so that way it's not dripping. because. Uh, any drips or whatever they get hard and then you have to come back and rewire wheel which you're not really supposed to do because it kind of creates a shield um, to kind of protect the metal um, so we want to put it on nice and thin we might put a couple coats of that let it dry for a day or two and then we'll come over it with a POR 15. One other thing I did off camera is I patched a hole right here on the other side is actually where the shock mount was so I had to rebuild that and it was all rotted out because it was all boxed in design that carried a bunch of moisture and just kind of rotted a little hole so I just so I rewelded a quarter inch plate on this side and then on the inside over here I had some scrap 2x2 two two steel that I just welded in and then I reused um, this part of the old shock mount and burned that into that piece so now it's nice and strong but anyway as far as this whole vinegar process I'm only doing a day because I'm a little bit impatient but if you let this stuff uh, soak for a week and keep reapplying it um, maybe get some saran wrap that's what I should have done so that way it kind of holds in that uh, moisture from the vinegar and you want to keep reapplying it um, you can probably get everything pretty much clean as you can see there's still some pitting this is the worst of the frame actually on this back piece I was debating on just replacing it with the C channel it's actually really heavily pitted which maybe uh, later on I might come back and replace it but try to get this project all finished up with the rear suspension so I'm going to hit this with a wire wheel, see how much of that uh, black rust we can knock out. But this is looking already 10 times better from uh, just grinding it before, before I did all the uh, vinegar treatment on it. Another note is wear gloves when you're doing this because that, that rusty vinegar uh, solution, it likes to embed into your hands and does not come off with anything. So 
That's what I learned yesterday when I applied all this. Alright, so I got the whole rear frame ground down as much as I wanted to do. Now I'm going to go and wipe everything down with some mineral spirits, and then we'll apply that rust cutter agent. Alright, now with this rust cutter, I'm going to spray it on here, brush it on, make sure there's no uh, runs going down, so that's why I got the brush here. You can already see with me brushing this on the chemical reaction that's going on with the rust in there. So it's going to convert that into a nice paintable surface for our POR15. And you do want to make sure you're in a well ventilated area because this stuff does uh, kind of stink a little bit. So make sure you have the door open or do it outside. Alright, so I got at least 24 hours of dry time on that rust cutter and you can kind of see it converted. Um, any of that rust to kind of like a blackish color and kind of turn any exposed bare metal kind of to a uh, grayish So this is a pretty much primed area. So I'm just going over with a POR 15 I'm going to do at least two to three coats of this stuff and then I'll move on to the self etching primer and then onto the final black top coat Alright, so this frame is looking pretty good after a couple coats of POR15, but we're not quite done yet with the painting process. Um, this is good if you're just leaving it underneath the car and you know, not really exposed to uh, any sunlight because with POR15, it's not UV resistant, so it will break down over time if you don't top coat it. Even though this is a frame, I'm still going to top coat it and give it a nicer finish. So I'm going to start off with some self etching primer that's really going to bite into this POR15 because it is a hard paint when it fully cures. Um, and since I missed that window of it uh, dry, you, when it's just slightly tacky, you can uh, then uh, prime it. But I waited too long, so I'm going to use some uh, self-etching primer. It's going to give that extra little bite. So I'm going to do a couple coats of this on the entire frame, and then we'll top coat it with some black semi-gloss paint. So finished up with a self etching primer. It took about two cans. I don't go too heavy on it, just enough to get even coverage. So about uh, two, three coats, because it does go on pretty thin um, as it is. You don't want anything too heavy. But now I'm gonna move on to the final coat, and that's gonna be this uh, Duplicolor Engine Enamel uh, ceramic paint, basically. Um, I like the finish on it. I've been using it on all the other parts on this Jeep. The part number on it is DE35. I like the semi-gloss finish it gives. So this is probably gonna take around three cans, because I'm gonna go a little bit heavier do three nice coats. First coat's going to be a nice tacky coat and then we'll finish off with two more heavier coats. Alright, so with the frame finally finished up on the paint, now is the time that we're going to start assembling everything. I've been waiting for this for a long time. Since this whole uh, cleaning up the rust on the frame took forever, um, it's finally nice to be able to start putting all these parts back on. So I'm going to start over here where the new leaf spring hangers are, as you guys recalled. 
we drilled out the holes on here for our new ones that came off of a Ford Ranger. So we can bolt these onto here now, now that the paint is dry. I'm gonna use hardware that was provided, but it's about inch and a half long, 7 16 bolts. Put some anti-seize on them. We got washers for each side and some lock nuts on the back, and then we can snug these down. These are probably gonna be a little bit tight in here since all that paint uh, kind of put a little bit of a layer, making these holes a little bit tighter. So I'm just gonna tap these in. Once we got all the bolts in, now I can go and snug this up. All right, so I'm just gonna blend that in with a little bit of paint that I used in the frame, and this thing will be looking pretty good. I'm gonna go ahead and do the other side off camera, and then we'll be back. All right, while we're waiting for those brackets to dry, I'm gonna move on to installing some bump stops. These are actually gonna be the same exact ones, um, same part number and everything as I'd installed on the front. I didn't video on getting these off, but it's the same process. Uh, two bolts on one side actually snapped, so I ended up just welding a nut to the top side and just spinning it off that way. But as you saw with the holes, um, since a little bit of paint got in them, I'm gonna run a tap through these since these are threaded inside the frame, just to clear them up, and then we can go and re-bolt these on with some new uh, 5 16 hardware. and these threads and I got some new flange nuts so we don't need to use a washer now I'll do the same to the other side all right, so now I'm getting ready to install the leaf springs. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that the larger eyelet always goes towards the front or wherever you don't have the shackle side. The smaller end's gonna go where the shackle is. Um, as you guys recall, um, this is how I did the uh, front uh, shackles. I reused them and then just got some uh, new bushings, pressed them in, had these sandblasted, repainted them. Um, so these are ready to go. I'm just reusing the factory ones for now. And one measurement I forgot to take was actually the distance off the frame to the new uh, leaf spring brackets um, since the Ford Ranger ones have a little bit wider of a gap um, to put the shackle in they're about three inches compared to um, it only being two and three quarter right here there's gonna be a little bit of a distance we're gonna have to make up um, with some washers uh, so I'm gonna get both sides assembled and then take some measurements and see if basically the uh, leaf springs are towed in or towed out towards the back and make adjustments as I need to by adding or subtracting washers on either side but overall, I got some new 916s hardware, some new lock nuts, and uh, some washers. I'm going to uh, put some anti on the bolts and inside the bushings on the leaf spring here and the shackles and get the leaf springs bolted up. All right, before I lift this up and bolt it to the frame, I'm gonna start off with uh, bolting on the shackles to the leaf spring when it's on the ground. That way it's a little bit easier since I'm only doing this with one person. So I'm gonna lube this up with some anti seize And since these are shackle under, we want to make sure that the, uh, the flat spot on the leaf spring is going to go orientate just like this. Put a little anti-seize in here because these are not fun when they seize up. Then I'm just going to tighten this up for now, not torque them yet until the full weight of the Jeep is back on the ground. But just enough to take up some of the slack. All right, now I'm gonna lift it up and bolt on the front over here and then kind of rest it on top of the leaf spring perch over here in the back and then we should bolt that in once we get the front end. And I'll stick a nut and a washer on the back side same thing, I'll tighten this up just to get the slack out. Now 
for back here. I'm just going to stick a bolt in. I'm not going to put any washers or anything because we're going to have to measure, make sure this is all aligned once we get the other side in. And it looks like we're actually going to have to flip this bolt around over here on the shackle because it's contacting a bracket over here. All right, now I should be able to flip this in here. go so now this is gonna have about a quarter inch of play right here that's what we want because we're gonna measure it um, from the front of the leaf spring to the back of the leaf spring um, just on the outside and that way we can dial in to get uh, equal measurements from the front and the back uh, depending on where it ends up and then we can add the shims accordingly so far that's looking pretty good I'm gonna go ahead and do the other side and then we'll start measuring and get this dialed in all right so I got the other side leaf spring just like how I did over here and what I'm doing right now is just taking a measurement from uh, the leaf springs from outer side to outer side and up here on the front it's measuring basically 53 inches exactly and coming to the back over here this is where we're gonna have to make our adjustments and it's actually dead on 53 right there and I actually have uh, the leaf springs pushed as far as it can go towards the frame so it looks like all we have to do is just uh, build up a quarter inch worth of shims or washers on the uh, outer side in between here and the bracket on uh, both sides over there so that way we can have proper spacing and that way this thing is going to be uh, pretty much aligned uh, that way it's not dog walking or anything weird down the road so I'm going to pull out these bolts again, uh, pile up our washers over here, bolt everything back on for the last time, then snug it up, but not torque it down just yet. All right, so leaf springs are in on both sides and uh, snugged up, but not torqued. And there's one thing that did catch my eye, and that's this axle shim right here. And if you guys know, this appears to be um, in the opposite direction. It's not because I installed the leaf springs backwards like it did the front. Um, this is how it's supposed to be with the big eyelet up there on the front. Um, if I were to flip it, uh, it wouldn't be able to fit in the shackle since that's three inches wide um, for the bushing over there. And then this is two and three quarter on the end. Um, so what we're going to have to do is actually uh, flip this guy around. It's not too big of a deal. It could just be a factory mistake or it could be required for this lift because this lift does work with a lot of years of Jeeps and uh, some suspension might be a little bit different across the board. So I'm going to save myself some time and not bolt in the axle because I know the pinion is basically going to be pointing towards the dirt and that's not what you want for a driveline angle. So I'm going to take a couple C-clamps and squeeze these leaf packs together so that way it doesn't all spring apart. Crack this free over here and then see if I can flip this guy around and then re-tighten it down. Alright, so this little nut up here is a 916. Just going to back this off a little bit. And then all I'm going to do is rotate this on the bottom right to there and then snug it back up. Make sure it's nice and parallel with the rest of the leaf packs. Surprisingly that pin is not spinning on the bottom. If it is you can take a vice grips and just kind of hold it in place. Right there is good. Now we can pull off our C-clamps, and there we go, that's all ready to go. I'm going to do the same thing on the other side, and then we're going to roll in the axle and get that bolted up. You guys haven't seen it, but I'm completely rebuilding that, um, so it's all painted up right now. It's pretty much gutted, but I'm going to put all the uh, insides all back together when it's fully mounted on the Jeep. That way it's a little bit easier handling it. Alright, so I'm going to line up the axle underneath the leaf springs and then they got this center pin that's going to correspond with the holes on these leaf spring perches on the axle. So we're going to line them up. I'm going to jack this up a little bit. Alright, so I got the axle lined up with that center pin on the leaf spring here, so that's locked into place. Now we can go ahead and put our U-bolts into place. And uh, let's talk about that real quick. So the U-bolts they sent me are these ones right here and these are 916 thread and the do not fit the axle tube actually for this Dana 44. This diameter on the axle tube for this uh, Dana 44 is two and three quarter. 
This one measures out to be three and a quarter, and this would be if you had the option, if you had a Dana 60 in the back, which a lot of them did. Um, this one did not, however, since it has the uh, Quadratrack four-wheel drive, so it has the Dana 44 in the rear, um, which I guess is a little bit more of a rare option compared to just having the Dana 60. I did, however, have some extra ones from my XJ uh, lift kit. This fits a Dana 44 or Dana 35 with the uh, same two and a three-quarter uh, diameter axle tube. However, these are only half inch threads, so it might be a little bit small for this setup. So I went and just ordered some new ones, Rough Country. Um, these are two and three quarter, um, nine sixteenths. These, however, are a little bit longer. Um, the shorter ones, which are about seven and a half inches, um, which the other two are, they were out of stock um, for a good month. So I just got the 10 inch ones, which aren't a big deal because we can just cut these down once we get them installed. I also went and got our uh, leaf spring plates that sandwiches this all together. I got these sandblasted and painted up. And these simply just sit on top here, just like so. So I'll take our new U-bolts, put them into place, put some nuts and washers on them, um, probably put some anti-seize on them since I love to use that stuff. Just going to put some anti-seize towards the base over here since we're going to be cutting off the top anyway. All right, now I'm going to tighten up all the slack and then uh, before we torque them down, we're going to get the other side into place and then we'll tighten it all down together. All right, so I got these tightened down as far as I can with the impact. It's not quite all the way down yet. That's pretty much as far as I got with my extension, and I don't have any ratchet wrenches for a 7 8 nut. So I'm just going to cut them right now. Should it be a big deal? I'm just going to cut a couple inches off the top of all of these studs. So a total of eight cuts, four per side. All right, so when tightening down these U-bolts, we want to go kind of in an alternating pattern, make sure they're all squeezing down, um, squeezing these two basically together evenly so it's not lopsided. Um, so I'm just going to do kind of like a crisscross pattern and evenly tighten it that way. And while I'm doing that, I want to make sure that the U-bolts are straight up and down. So I'm going to look for the back or front side, make sure they're not going to be uh, off to one way or the other. We want them straight up and down. And I'm going to do basically both sides at the same time. And with these 916 U-bolts, they're going to be torqued down to 87 foot-pounds. I have this spoken in my first video when I said there are only 60 foot-pounds. That's if you have the smaller half-inch U-bolts. Um, all the U-bolts on this J10 are going to be 916 and torqued down to 87 foot-pounds when we're all done. All right, with all the U-bolts torqued down, we can move on to the shocks. All right, so now for installing the new shocks, um, just like the fronts, I installed a sleeve on one end so that way we can accommodate a bolt. So we just have a half inch fine thread bolt right here that's gonna be on the axle side over on the Jeep truck. And I installed some metal bushings in there so that way this fits properly in there. Um, each shock does come with four different sizes so you can choose um, for your application what it's going to work best for whatever bolt you have and as well as the length of bushing that's in there. Now for these I'm actually going to have to install them upside down compared to how they traditionally are from the factory. That's because this shock has a larger diameter uh, body on it compared to the factory ones over here and because of that if I were to install it with the cylinder side downward it actually does contact the axle tube with this shock body right here um, once you connect it up to the top part on the frame. So we're going to do the opposite and flip it and have the rod being exposed in the bottom and the body over here on the top. But overall, should be a big deal. And then on the bottom over here, which you're going to connect to the top over on the frame side, I don't need to put a sleeve in here because it does have a proper shock mount over on the frame. But once again, to help you install these metal bushings, if you have to do them, I just use a little bit of uh, silicone grease or dielectric grease, whatever you got, same thing. And I use the mallet and they pound it in pretty nicely. So now I'm going to go over to the Jeep and then we'll get this installed. All right, so for installing these shocks, I'm just going to take a little bit of grease just on the inside here so that we don't you know, get any squeaky bushings and it slides in easier for installation. 
And I put a little bit of anti-seize inside that uh, bushing over here. So after I installed this axle over here, I was taking a look at the drive shaft and how everything aligned and debating on what I should do. And I ended up actually removing that leaf spring shim entirely because what was happening is the pinion was actually pointing too far up in the air and creating an angle to drive shaft, um, kind of uh, like a mountain peak when it's supposed to be a little bit below, kind of like a divot to be matching the angle that's coming out of the transfer case, except for it to be opposite. Since this drive shaft setup isn't a double carnage setup, um, it's actually a uh, slip drive shaft, but it only has one U-joint on either end, so uh, the angles have to be equal and opposite to each other to prevent any driveline vibrations. So with the shim in there, either one way or the other, it wasn't getting the ideal angle, but I think I got it dialed with it actually out of there for now. And once I get the axle internals and the drive shaft hooked up and all the way back down, I'll be able to tell for sure, take an angle finder and actually see um, our angles and maybe drive it down the road, see if I got any vibrations. Then I can tweak it from there, maybe just doing like one or two degree uh, shims to adjust. But I think this is going to get it as close as I can for now. Um, so that's what I did for this. The reason why they have those shims on there probably is because this kit does fit a lot of variations from short bed to long bed to uh, wagoneers and everything like that. A lot of different wheel bases, so you're going to get a lot of different drive shaft lengths and a lot of different pinion angles associated with that. This is what worked out on my J10 with the long wheel base, which I think is around 131 inches. So I decided to take the shim off for now. All right, so a little update. The bed is back on the Jeep, and we got the full weight of the Jeep back down on the axles. I finished up the axle and everything like that. Um, so now the Jeep is on its suspension, and it's at ride height. So now the last thing we got to do is torque down our leaf spring bolts that bolt to the frame. And uh, there's no real uh, torque spec for these um, that I found agreeing on, but anywhere between 80 and 105 foot-pounds, I'm just going to go up to about 95 or 100 foot-pounds, and we'll start from there. Um, later on, uh, if we put some miles on this thing, we'll uh, retorque everything. Um, same as the U-bolts, because those things like to stretch. just got to do the other side and then we're pretty much finished all right guys that's going to be a wrap for today's video this video has been taking a long time in the process i think i started around in january or february finishing up the front suspension and it's now the beginning of august and i'm glad to be done with this and on to something else a little bit more simpler hopefully uh mostly just that rear frame uh, restoring that rebuilding brackets that's what took the longest i also was moving in the process so it's a different garage compared to the beginning of the video but we're finally done and the Jeep truck is looking nice with that 3 inch lift. We're going to get tires and wheels here hopefully soon and it's really going to bring this thing around. There's still a lot of rust work I had to repair on this thing. I still got to do some cab mounts and stuff like that, do the floors, and uh, I'll record that if you guys are interested as well. I want to give a big thanks to Rough Country for sending out the suspension lift. It really motivated me to get that on here and replace all the other little things uh, along the way. And uh, any other products that I use in the video, I'll post that in the description below so you guys can find it as well. So if you guys like this video and found it helpful, make sure to like, subscribe to the OutJP YouTube channel to help keep these videos coming. We've got some more content on the way, especially for some XJ stuff, so make sure you guys stay tuned. If you guys have any questions or comments, make sure to post them below, and we'll see you guys in the next video.